recruits, and welcome to Astroneer Academy 203, my first base. The previous course concluded our introduction to the general concepts and operation of most items available to an Astroneer. But Exodynamics has not sent us forth into this unexplored solar system simply to memorize a few facts. And you do know what Exodynamics is, right? Well, if you have somehow not caught on to their presence yet, let's do a quick review. Exodynamics is the predominant conglomerate of space exploration during the 25th century's intergalactic age of discovery. All astroneers are representatives of Exodynamics, and we have been tasked with colonizing worlds and unearthing rare treasures and discoveries. Exodynamics' presence can be felt and seen no matter where you are in the solar system. When you first launched to Silva, that long-range exploration vehicle you launched from is owned by Exodynamics. The starting shelter and the startup package that you deploy from the nearby landing pad are sent by Exodynamics. They provided the schematics for all the items in the research catalog, and when crafted, most of those items are contained in Exodynamics packages, and you'll encounter numerous crash sites across every moon and planet. Those are all Exodynamic missions that failed disastrously. And given the number of crash sites that you encounter, it seems that maybe Exodynamics favors a quantity over quality approach to launching astronauts into space, so I suppose we should just consider ourselves lucky that we survived the initial landing. Exodynamics even drops research aids to assist us in unlocking items in the research catalog, and they occasionally send drops of rare items made purely for recreation. Exodynamics has even commissioned the Astroneer Academy to ensure your success. Of course, Exodynamics is a corporation, so they kind of expect us to do some work. There are bases to be built and discoveries to be made, but there are also adventures to be had, fun to be made, and mysteries to solve. So, let's take all of the practical knowledge of the first several Astroneer Academy courses and begin to apply it starting with your first fully functional base in Astroneer. As we discussed in Astroneer Academy 101, Exodynamics has supplied us with the basic items to survive in this strange new world. We have a shelter, a platform, a printer, and an oxygenator. But beyond those items, it's up to us to obtain resources to create our first operational base so that we can begin making some progress. So what exactly is a fully functional base for an astroneer? Well, the answer to that question can have some slight variations depending on who you ask, but most experienced astroneers can agree on a few things. You'll want to create defined areas for power, production, research, and storage. How you go about doing that will vary based upon your personal preference from all of the options that are available to you. But let's discuss some best practices that can help you build a functional base. Before you even begin base building, it's not a bad idea to expand the footprint of your area just a bit. Equip a canister to your backpack, select a nice flat spot near your starting shelter, and begin flattening a large area around you. The area around your base may have hills, holes, cave openings, and all other sorts of things that make it difficult to move about your base and place platforms. Having a nice flat area eliminates these issues and it gives you plenty of space to work within. You can always flatten additional areas later if you find yourself running out of room, but starting with a large flat space will give you a great start. To help your base stand out as truly your own, you might want to pick up a couple of zinc and create a terrain analyzer and an inhibitor mod. You Use the terrain analyzer to select a color that you want for your base, then equip the inhibitor mod. Simply change your terrain tool to build up and start painting. As you can see, you won't actually be adding any soil, just painting what is already there. For an extra bit of flair, try recoloring just the dull gray areas that may have been created while you were flattening, leaving any existing colors in place. So with a flat, blank canvas to work with, it's time to consider the layout of your base. Again, each astroneer has their own personal preferences, but there are some things you might want to consider. As your base grows, your power needs will grow with it. Early on in your adventures, you may only need to generate enough power to keep a research chamber fully functional. But soon you find that you're adding a smelter so that you can create vehicles and other objects. That means you're going to need even more power. Factor in a soil centrifuge and suddenly you need 9 units of power per second just to keep the machinery of your base operating at full speed. Keeping things running at full speed may not seem like a big problem. But there are very few worse annoyances in the life of an astronaut than finding yourself suddenly out of power and just a few hundred bytes short of unlocking a much needed item. All of your progress comes to a standstill as you begin desperately hoping that the wind will start
start to blow or you await sunrise. You can avoid this frustrating scenario by properly planning power production for your base and then expanding that power production as your base grows. Now your layout for power producers can be anything you want it to be, but you might want to keep a couple of things in mind when designing your power production. First, unless you want to use extenders, you need at least one power cable that can reach from your power production area to the rest of your base. Second, you'll want to ensure that you have enough space for future expansion. If you have built your power production right at the edge of a huge canyon or right up against a forested area, you're going to be facing a lot of terraforming later as your power demands increase. Of course, many astroneers also take aesthetics into consideration. There are a few things more satisfying than a well-organized base, and the power production portion of your base plays a big role in that. Wind turbines all neatly aligned, batteries grouped together, generators all together and facing the same way, well, all of that can go a very long way to creating a visually pleasing power production area. You will also want to consider which power producers you plan on using to create power for your base. If you're going to rely heavily on solar, you wouldn't want to have your power production area too close to the foot of a mountain. That mountain could potentially block sunlight for a portion of the day, leaving those solar panels in the shadows and inactive. Are you going to primarily use wind power? Then take several moments and become familiar with the wind patterns surrounding your base. You can easily see where the wind is blowing and where it is not blowing just by looking around and observing the streaks in the air as the wind blows. Believe it or not, the wind can be blowing in one area near your base while just a few feet away, the air is completely still. By taking the time to observe where the wind blows most often near your base, you can plan out the best spot for power production from wind power. But maybe you'd rather use generators as your primary power production. If so, you're going to need two things and in fairly large quantities. First, you're going to need a lot of storage for those generators. Medium generators cannot transfer power unless they're connected to a platform that has power cables. And while small generators can be placed directly on the ground utilizing their built-in power cables, it's still a good idea to move them onto a platform of some sort. As your base grows and you need to expand your power production, you will inevitably need to reconfigure the layout of your power producers. If you have eight small generators on the ground, you have to move them one by one. If you have all eight of them on a medium storage attached to a platform, however, you only need to pick up that medium storage to relocate all eight generators at once. And of course, this same principle applies to all the other small power producers as well. And if you're relying on generators for power, the second thing you'll want is plenty of storage for fuel. You'll want to ensure your organic or carbon is attached to storage on the same platform as your generators. This will save you time as your generators will be able to automatically pull their own fuel source instead of you needing to manually place a resource on them each time they run empty. But that means you're going to need a lot of storage, and in turn, you're going to be using larger platforms that can easily accommodate both generators and the fuel storage. One other thing to consider if you plan on relying primarily on generators is that you'll want to keep power production close enough to your base and laid out in an organized manner so that you can easily turn the generators off when their power output is not required. Unless you really want to spend a lot of time gathering organic and smelting carbon, you definitely will want to turn those generators off when they're not needed. No matter what combination of power producers you choose, it is a good idea to keep your power production area rather compact so that your power cables can easily connect to all of your power producing platforms while also providing flexibility for how you connect your power grid to the rest of your base. Early on, power production can be a difficult thing to manage. You may recall that in Astroneer Academy 103, we discussed taking some time to explore so that you can retrieve power items that are scattered about each planet. Eventually, you will want to return to your base and begin setting up those power items to start making some progress. And that's when you might discover that you don't have quite enough power to get everything up and running at full speed. So, I mean, I guess you could immediately head back out for another run to find more power, you could spend resources to craft power items, or you could try a different approach. Make what you have work for you. Extenders can allow you to prioritize which items receive power. For example, let's imagine that you have a smelter, research chamber, and atmospheric condenser. Those three items together require 11 units per second to keep all three fully powered. But maybe you only have 10 units of power being produced. And let's also imagine that, for whatever reason, you want to ensure that the smelter and that the atmospheric condenser are fully powered at all times. But you don't want to completely stop your research either. 
So what do you do? You could set up splitters and manually adjust how much power is going to each platform holding each machine. Or you could do something much simpler. You could connect the atmospheric condenser and smelter directly to your power producers and then connect the research chamber via an extender. Your atmospheric condenser and smelter will receive full power and the excess power, in this case one unit per second, will flow over into the research chamber. This does allow research to continue, albeit at a much slower rate, while also allowing your priority machines to run at full speed. In fact, this system of prioritization can scale up quite easily. This works because of the difference between how regular power cables and power cables from extenders transmit power. Regular power cables will always evenly distribute all available power across everything that is connected via those regular power cables. The power cables for extenders, however, will only distribute excess power. So in the scenario that we imagined above, we were producing 10 units per second, and the atmospheric condenser and smelter were consuming 9 units. By using an extender to connect the research chamber, that extender was able to take the remaining one unit of power and send it along to the research chamber. Had all three machines been connected via regular power cables, all three would have ran at a reduced speed. So until you reach a point where your power production exceeds what you could possibly ever consume, you can utilize extenders to create prioritization in your power network. When you're not out on adventures, making new discoveries, and solving mysteries, a lot of your time will be spent back at your base producing items to assist you in even more adventures so that you can make even greater discoveries and solve even more mysteries. Because of this, it's a good idea to put some thought into where each production item is going to be placed on your base. A poorly laid out base will quickly become a hindrance as you spend time navigating around things and just trying to remember where you put stuff. And while each astroneer will have a preference for what goes where and on which type of platform, there are some general practices to keep in mind. To get it started, here's a pro tip from Ron for consistent and repeatable alignment of medium in large base platforms. You can print your next platform by placing the printer on your current platform and then rotating it to place the hologram in the desired position. Print and unpack that platform without moving it. The new platform will be placed perfectly aligned with the current platform. This works for platforms being placed in line or parallel to the current platform. Thanks for that pro tip, Ron. Since your first base will most likely consist of medium and large platforms only, this is a great way to ensure that things are lined up nicely. When laying out your base, it is a good idea to keep your more commonly used items near each other. Again, what you use the most is going to vary based upon your particular approach to being an astroneer, so your base layout will differ from mine. But for me personally, I find that I can gather quite a bit of research by its early on, so I tend to keep my research chambers in their own area and to the outer edge of my production area. Even if it's still early on and I don't have a lot of research bites yet, I still have to wait on research items to be completely analyzed and converted into bites. So since I have to wait, having a small area dedicated to research that's not right in the middle of the production area is a good idea in general. From there, I tend to think about what I'm going to use most often. For most resource gathering, I prefer to head out on a vehicle equipped with a drill. Because of this, I tend to keep my shredder and trade platform to one end of my production area. That's because I tend to only use them in emergencies. I also tend to only use the soil centrifuge for the few natural resources that are produced in quantities of 6 or higher, so the centrifuge tends to be the next item and maybe a little bit closer to the center of my production area. And because many of those natural resources need to be smelted to make use of them, I usually keep my smelter really close to, if not on the same platform as, my soil centrifuge is placed on. The atmospheric condenser can produce a large quantity of gas over time, and it can run continuously, so I usually keep it towards the edge edges of my production area. I do, however, find myself spending quite a bit of time creating composite resources, so I like for the chemistry lab to be very close to my smelter and soil centrifuge. This allows me to easily move natural and refined resources from the respective machines over to the chemistry lab. I also like to keep my printers near this main cluster within my production area as well. By keeping the printers close by, I can easily move the various resources to the printers without a lot of traveling back and forth. Of course, almost every astroneer has some varying quantity of resources that they need to store at their base. And that brings us to a pro tip from Gina. 
Thanks, Brandon, and hello again, recruits. Let's talk storage. Many astroneers make the mistake of skipping medium storage early on and instead opt to dig small holes or create piles to store resources. This is a bad idea because all of those resource nuggets colliding against one another can actually cause performance issues. When items are sitting one on top of another, the CPU and GPU are constantly calculating the physics of each item both individually and in relation to the others and drawing the resulting visual animations and sounds that you see and hear in game. A storage hole can very quickly cause a drop in performance, especially as it relates to frames per second, but this extra strain on your computer or console can easily be eliminated by gathering a bit of resin and creating medium storage to store things on. The medium storage is unlocked by default and only requires two resin to be crafted on the small printer. When placed on a medium storage, your CPU and GPU only has to worry about the physics and animation of the storage itself and not each individual resource nugget. Thanks for that, Pro tip, Gina. In addition to avoiding unnecessary lag, putting some thought into resource storage also allows you to be able to quickly access a resource when you need it. Because of this, I like to keep resource storage near my production area so that I can easily move unneeded resource over to storage while also being able to quickly grab resources that I do need. While it may not seem apparent at first, you should also put some thought into your vehicles while laying out your base. When you return from gathering resources and other items, it's nice to have enough space to drive your vehicle right up to the location that you wish to unload. Because of this, you will want to ensure that you leave enough space around each section of your base so that you can get your laying vehicles in and out easily. The same holds true for shuttles. While you have no control over the location of the landing pad on your starter base, you can design around it so that the landing pad is at least close enough to your storage area to allow you to easily unload items from your shuttle. And if you're setting up a brand new base, think about where you're going to place a landing pad so that you don't spend too much time walking back and forth. It can be a bit of a challenge to make room to accommodate large vehicles while also ensuring that your base building platforms are connected, but you do want to ensure that those connections are made. Power is not the only thing flowing through all of those platforms. There is also life-sustaining oxygen. By ensuring that you keep everything in the immediate area of your base connected, you're making sure that you don't wind up suffocating. The final piece to consider when setting up a base is general storage. Now, this is different than your resource storage. Instead, we're talking about items that you've crafted that you don't use very frequently. You could just toss them aside, but doing so can make it difficult to locate them later when you do actually need them. Since these are things that you don't need very frequently, set up a general storage area somewhere near the edge of your base to store these items. With all of these best practices in mind, you should now be ready to tackle building your first base. As you begin to build, do not be afraid to try new ideas. Maybe you found that your setup isn't working as well as you thought it should. Tear it down and start over. Iterate on your previous setups, making small tweaks and changes as you redesign. Find new ways to optimize your workspace, and then tear it all down again and keep iterating. With each new base you build, you'll find ideas that you really like and some that you do not. But as you continue to redesign and put even more thought into your base, you'll soon settle on some general things that you find work best for you. And at the end of it all, there are a few things more satisfying for an astroneer than a well laid out base. And now that you have your first fully functional base, it's time to say goodbye to that starting base on Silva and look to the moon and other interplanetary destinations. That is our discussion for our next course, Astroneer Academy 204, where we will be joined by a very special guest lecturer. So until then, I'm Brandon, reminding you to stay vainglorious.